So, let us now discuss the effect of the solid pile up in the liquid in the different growth form formations during solidification of alloys. As you see, I have kept all these pictures, all the things, plots which I have drawn in the last lecture for your reference, so that you do not have to follow up again from the earlier lecture. And as, to, as well as I have drawn the phase diagrams for you to understand. So, we have been discussing on solidification of the alloy X p 0. And I told you that the most realistic situation of solid profile is this one, the last one at the bottom one in this in these pictures. So, let us assume that we have a solid build up in the in this uh, at the interface. So, if I draw that I need to draw it to, to explain is. So, this is my solid x p and this is the distance. So, what I have drawn is basically solid profile. This is k b z k x p 0, this is x p 0, x p l and this is x p e. Okay. So, this is let me just draw it k x p 0 is here. x p l and this is x p e. So, that is why they are coming higher and this is x p 0 and what I have done let me draw a line here. So, this is I am talking about intermediate case Okay. So, this is the solid profile look like. Now, how can I use this solid profile to discuss about the different growth form forms? Well, let us do that. Remember, this is composition versus x profile distance. Now, I can actually take composition the liquid. So, suppose this is my x b l 1, x b l 2 like that. Okay, it goes on, it actually goes much become flatter later on x p l n something like that. Now, these compositions in the liquid will determine its liquid temp liquidus temperature obviously, because in the phase diagram this is liquidus let us put it in color otherwise it is very difficult to follow. So, this is my liquidus okay, and this is my solidus, right? The green one. So, uh, as you clearly see, the temperature. This is a temp temperature versus composition plot. That means, for if any composition on these liquidus, I can determine the temperature. If I know the liquid composition here, I know the temperature here. That is the liquidus temperature. So, therefore, if I know the composition of the solute in the liquid, this is what is given by this profile. It looks like an exponential. I given the equation also, it is exponential. So, I can actually measure composition at each point on the liquid, in the liquid. Okay, I can see here, I can do that. And then I can actually plot these compositions on this axis, on the x axis of this, on this phase diagram. So, by doing that, I will know what are the liquidus temperatures. So, as you can clearly see when the liquidus is very high, temperature will be low, right? Because that is at these interface that the composition is very high, there is a spike, then slowly goes down. So, therefore, at the interface temperature will be very low because as you see how the liquid composition is liquidus composition high, temperature is lower. So, as the composition increases and finally it becomes same as X B0, the temperature goes down, right? So, therefore, if I plot now here x as a function of T L, T L is my liquidus temperature. So, what will happen? Okay, I am drawing for the liquid, solid there is no liquidus temperature. So, obviously, 
it will be very high, very low here because this composition is slow and let us mark this as point, this point and then it will slowly increase, right? Slowly it increase, this is what it will look like because composition is high, so liquid is slow, composition is lower, liquid is higher, that is very simple, that is a direct correlation. So, that is mass liquid as. Now, this is my interface, right? The question is this, if this interface develops, suppose a protrusion like this or another protrusion like that, whether these protrusions will grow or not, okay? If they do not grow, the interface will move like a flat. If they grow, interface will break down and form dendrites, that is what will happen. So, under what condition they will grow? Obviously, this is my equilibrium liquidus temperature, right? That is what I have done, equilibrium liquidus temperature. Why it is equilibrium liquidus? Because we are drawing it for the phase diagram and phase diagram tells you equilibrium information. Actual situation may be different. So, this is tells you because this is T x L versus distance plot. So, this any point on this curve will tell you the slope or the gradient, temperature gradient in the liquid any point on this curve because this is a plot between temperature versus x, x is the distance. So, now actual experimental conditions may not be following or it will not follow the equilibrium situation because in actual experimental condition we may be extracting heat faster, we may be cooling slowly, we may be doing you know many other things, actual experimental conditions actually vary. So, therefore, in actual experimental condition the temperature gradient in the liquid can be modified, can be changed. So, suppose if I impose certain experimental conditions and temperature gradient in liquid looks like this, this is my experimental condition, this is equilibrium T, this is my experimental T L, T L experiments 1, under 1 experimental conditions my liquid is temperature looks like that or basically temperature gradient has a this much value, you know this is basically given by this slope. Now, if I have such a kind of situations, that means the actual temperature gradient is higher than the equilibrium temperature gradient. So, if there is a any kind of a protrusion forms in this, they will melt because temperature gradient is higher, actual temperature is higher than the equilibrium temperature. And because of that, if there is at all any kind of a protrusion or any kind of a things form the interface, interface become little bit jagged just like the ones which I shown you in the last lecture, they will melt back, they will be melt back and the interface will remain flat. So, therefore, this is the experimental condition one in which interface will remain flat, it will not be at all forming any kind of features. But suppose, okay, let me draw this is as a white line so that you do not forget, this is my first condition. Suppose, I have, I have a little other experimental condition in which the, the slope or the gradient is like this, this is T L experiment 2, correct. As you see here in the region from this part to this part, this point, okay, the liquid as temperature, actual liquid as temperature of the sample that is the experimental T L experiment 2 is lower than the equilibrium liquid as temperature. So, because temperature is lower, the liquid, if, if there is a solid protrusion forms here, okay, if solid protrusion form here like this, they will feel comfortable, they will not melt back, they will feel that they are undercooled. Why they undercooled? Because temperature is lower than the equilibrium liquidus temperature. Remember, anything below this equilibrium liquidus temperature, solid can remain present because this is the region between alpha plus liquid. Anything above, it is only liquid. So, Above this temperature, liquid can only remain. Below this temperature, solid and liquid both can remain. So, because the temperature here is lower than the equilibrium liquid temperature, because of experimental conditions, we are going to have develop this kind of phase selections or this kind of features on the surface, and these features will then grow as the time goes on. These features will become bigger, much, much bigger. And finally, these features will become dendrites. Okay.
they will form dendrites. So, first interface breaks down, we form cells, cells do not have any surf, you know, secondary arms or tertiary arms, then secondary or tertiary arms forms, they become dendrites, that is what happens in actual practice. So, therefore, formation of alloy dendrites is something to do with the undercooling because of composition or because of constitutional and this theory is known as constitutional undercooling. theory. This is has been described as a constitutional undercooling theory. So, therefore, without even going into uh, you know, details of the different aspects, we can simply explain why such a kind of things such dendrites and cells form in the alloy dendrites. But this theory always have two problems. This theory is very simple and elegant also, very elegantly explains things very easily that whenever I have actual temperature gradient is lower than the equilibrium temperature gradient in the liquid, we will have serrations formation on the surface interface and this protrusion or serration whatever you call, they will grow into the liquid and that is how these dendritic growth forms will arise. But you know it undergoes two important things, one the gradient is mainly because of composition. So, if suppose I have a pure metal. I do not have any solute present, there will be no compositional gradient developed and that means all the pure materials should go by a flat interface, there will be no dendrites. But as you have seen in the last lecture, in pure metal also we do see dendrites and these dendrites because mainly because of the temperature, thermal effects, not because of compositional effects. That is the number one drawback of this theory. Second drawback which is more important whenever you create you have a flat interface as compared to a flat one, the curved one or cells or dendrites will have a larger surface area or interfacial area and this interfacial area change will lead to change of the energetics of the system. If I have to add total energy of system as a P energy decrease because of the liquid to solid transformation that we have seen in the earlier lecture also plus the energy because of this interface then only I will find the actual things will not be so simple. But this theory it completely undermines the effect of interfacial area, they never consider the interfacial area at all. So, therefore, this theory is cannot talk about the scale of microstructure, whether smaller size dendrites will form or bigger size dendrites will form, they cannot discuss because they are not considering, they have not considered the effect of interfacial area. So, these are the two basic problems of this theory, the, although this was discovered long back 1954, but this has this problem that is why this theory was discarded later on. In fact, in 1960s, 1963, 60, 64, 65, <coughs> this theory was discarded and people have described a new theory, which I will just give a glimpse of that, I will not discuss about much about this, because that is a part of solidification that is not part of the phase transformation. Okay. So, instead of thinking of a constitutional undercooling, the main reason behind identity growth, we can simply think that I have a flat interface initially, okay, this is so solid, this is liquid and there is always some fluctuation present in the interface in terms of temperature, in terms of composition. Temperature may not be uniform across the interface, interface is microscopically not small, okay. maybe thickness is small, but the length is not small. So, there will be always some fluctuations of the temperature or composition or maybe some other elements like oxygen, nitrogen in the environment. These fluctuations can lead to interface perturbed, interface will become perturbed. That means, I can develop some sinusoidal perturbations on the surface. You see this is a sinusoidal curve. You can also have co-sinusoidal or any other kind of perturbations. Now, the question is this, fine, because of compositional change or temperature grade, temperature variation across the interface, certain kind of perturbation has developed, acceptable, understandable. 
Now question is that under what condition these perturbations will grow? They will they have two choices either this perturbation will vanish, the interface will remain flat or these perturbations can grow and form again cells and dendrites. So, that was done much later and that explained why dendrites form and why these growth forms are present in the actual solidified materials. Well, then there are many other things which I will not be I will not be able to discuss you because that takes a lot of time, but that is this theory is well known okay. and this theory is there in the literature. So, you can even in the books also you can read it, but in this book also it is there is the tells uh, talks about this theory and uh, discuss about that. So, before I uh, complete this today lecture, let me just introduce you a new things which we will discuss today as a part of liquid solid transformation which is very widely present in the in the uh, lit in the in the in the different alloy systems that is the eutectic solidification. Remember we are all discussing about single phase solidification so far whether it is a pure metal or it is an alloy we are only discussing about single phase solidification, but multi phases are also very important as a part of your curriculum multi phase is means only eutectic solidification is present. So, I will spend about 5 6 minutes today and the next lecture on eutectic solidification before we simply uh, in a complete this part of the uh, course on solid liquid solid transformation and move ahead for the other things. So, eutectics are very common in the actual practice. We use many eutectic alloys right, we use lead tin as a solar material, we use aluminum silicon as a cylinder blocks of the uh, engines in the cars and the trucks or we use cast iron, these are all eutectic alloys. So, that way it is important that you have some idea how eutectic solidifies in the uh, these materials. Obviously, eutectics are much more uh, complex than we think about it, than we actually suppose, but they are much more complex. Actually, the eutectic solidification can vary from one system to others. So, we will be not able to discuss in details that much that whether the utility solidification in aluminum silicon alloy is distinctly different from the cast iron or not that is not possible for me to discuss, but I will give a generalized theory of utility solidification so that you have some idea about it and you can then build on it later on. As you know uh, the classical eutectic phase diagram is little bit different from what I have drawn, I have also drawn a part of the phase diagram. So, eutectic phase diagrams are actually very widely present in the literature. You will find many phase diagrams where eutectic is widely present. A simplest eutectic phase diagram with two terminal solutions is like that. So, alpha beta the two terminal solutions and eutectic is basically the lowest melting solid in this phase diagram as you see here that both the liquidus is going down and they are meeting at a point whose temperature is lower than the melting temperature of pure A and melting temperature of pure B. So, therefore, eutectic reaction is basically liquid going to alpha plus beta when at the temperature T it happens, the T is basically given by this line, this is invariant line we know that. So, eutectic is a very classical phase you know reaction. So, what does it tell? This particular reaction tells you that from the liquid two solid phases simultaneously form two solid phases are directly forming together from the liquid. Depending on the how the solid phases will be distributed in the microstructure, you can have different kinds of morphologies. The classical one which is present in the lead tin or other alloys is basically lamella. I will show you all this picture in the next lecture, lamella. Okay. You can also have 
rod type that means one of the phases will be like a rod either alpha or beta whosoever volume fraction is little lower. You can also have spiral or acicular. eutectic or globular spiral eutectic is found in magnesium zinc system acicular is aluminum silicon and globular is found in copper oxygen cu cu2 so lamella is basically lead tin rod is basically nickel aluminum or niobium silicon. There are many other morphologies I am not discussing about that. The important ones are these. You can also have eutectic with Chinese creep microstructure. So, those are actually uh, very special cases, but these are actually routine normal things. Normally, you find most of the eutectics are lamella type like lead tin is one classical example or rod type. Normally, rod type eutectic forms in one of the phases is basically fall passion is low. You can also have a spiral if suppose uh, one of the phases, both the phases have different thermal expansion coefficients, uh, then you have a spiral eutectic. Very simple, if I have a bi metallic rod okay, of suppose say two metals and if I start heating it up because of the difference in thermal expansion coefficients, one will bend over the other and then is the one that is the way spiral eutectic forms. You can also have acicular eutectic, one of the eutectic phases fibrous like silicon in aluminum silicon is basically fibrous, but the aluminum is a continuous phase. You can also have a globular like one of the phase Cu2O is basically forms like a gobble in the continuous matrix of Cu. So, these are all very classical uh, things which are found in the literature and the books. I will show you some of these slides in the next lecture and then I will try to develop a theoretical foundation where you can actually use the uh, use the theories to explain the formation of eutectic.